Rod, have you ever been to Montana before? I have not. What, uh, what, what was the sort of the process that led you here? How did they first get in touch with you? Well, I was supposed to come last year um, when I was working with the Raiders. And um, a couple weeks before the event, our head coach switched our days off and, and told us a couple weeks beforehand, which I couldn't make it. Um, or I'd have been here last year. But um, you know, it's, it's the heart of the country. I'm from Indiana. I'm a, I'm a country boy from Indiana, so it's always good to come back to the to the heart of what our country's all about. Bill mentioned it. Engineer, you went to an engineering school. I know you wanted to be an engineer once upon once upon a time. I tried. Cool. I tried. <laughs> I wasn't smart enough. I tried to get in there to double E at Purdue, and not quite. Not quite. <laughs> Who's some of the best offensive talent in the history of the NFL during the time you were playing? Who are some of the most challenging players you face? Oh wow, that's a that's a big open-ended question right there, man. I played 17 years. <laughs> um, I played against a lot of good offensive players. Um, you know, you, when you look at quarterbacks, I played against. Uh, I haven't counted all of them, but I'm thinking over. 10 to 12 Hall of Fame quarterbacks. Um, they all are great in their own right, uh, but I think the best one I've ever played against was Dan Marino. I mean, Dan couldn't run from here to you guys in 10 seconds. You know, it would take him forever, but he could throw that football. He could move in the pocket. He knew how to dip his shoulder, how to read the coverages. And, you know, we were bringing pressure left and right. We could never get to him. Um, and when you look at him, no disrespect to his teammates, um, but it was normally Dan. Um, I know he had some decent receivers and, and he had some okay running backs, but he never had great players around him. And it was based on Dan Marino. You know, and when he threw for the 5,000 yards, and you know, it was kind of like a every year occurrence nowadays. But when he threw it, when he did it back then, that's a lot of yards, man. That's like throwing for 8,000 yards now. You know, nobody, nobody thought it could happen. So. Um, I just thought he was the best quarterback. And then when you look at receivers, receivers, you know, Jerry, I only played against Jerry twice, played against Timmy a couple of times, played against Michael a couple of times. The guy I played every year that gave me a lot of issues was a guy named Webster Slaughter. Oh, yeah. Old Cleveland Brown guy. Yeah, me and him didn't like each other that much early on. Uh, we got quite a few fights when we were young. Uh, got kicked out of one game. Um, but he was, a, he, was, he was quick, he was fast. Anytime you find a receiver that can change directions on a dime, he's going to create separation from DBs. Um, and he causes DBs headaches. Um, so I would think he was the, the best receiver that I've faced on a consistent basis, along with Andre Reid, I forgot about that. Because we did play Buffalo quite a bit. And Andre played in the slot. And big, strong, physical guy in the slot. And when you look at Andre... Kelly and Thurman, it was, that was their offense. With a, you know, a really good offensive line. And, I mean, every, these guys nowadays are doing what the K-Gun did with no microphones in their helmets and talk to the quarterbacks. So that was kind of neat. Um, the best running back, by far, Barry Sanders. That dude, that dude's good. <laughs> that dude's good. Um, I, I think the biggest thing with Barry is that he was really the only running back, and we played against Emmett, and, uh, Ed and all those guys. Uh, he was the only guy that we game planned because we told our outside rushers cannot get up the field. If he ducks left, don't go. Cannot fold. Cannot chase. You don't know where he's going because he's going to come back to you eventually. So when you game plan, uh, when you game plan a running back like that, uh, you got to give him much respect. Tight ends, yeah, none of them really hurt. <laughs> you think, uh, how do you think you fare against some of the, the tight end positions that we evolved? You got guys like Jimmy Graham, some of these former basketball players who make a lot of athletic plays. You're a pretty athletic safety yourself, though. How do you think you fare against some of these guys? Well, they would not, I don't think they would outran me. Um, I think the biggest thing is when you see these receivers that are big nowadays. I mean, like Calvin Johnson. When I first saw Calvin Johnson jog on a field, I'm like, oh my gosh, that dude's a receiver. He looked like a tight end, but he was fast, physical. He can, he still had good movement for a big receiver. You know, looked like Julio Jones. Julio was the same way, big, fast, physical guy. Those guys give you headaches as a as a as a DB. Um, 
the tight ends, you know, you look at Gronk and all those big guys and Jimmy, the catch radius is bigger, is longer because they're taller. Um, you know, as a player, you know, you believe that they're not going to run you. So we, you know, we would do what we always call, we just catch them. We'll catch them at five and just run with them. Try to make it tough on the quarterback to throw in a small window. Now, obviously, you don't want to like get like ruin anything for your speech tonight. But what are some of the key points that you're going to be going over? Obviously, you'll probably talk about adversity. I mean, in '95, you went through that gruesome injury, and you made it back in time for the Super Bowl. I'm sure you'll mention something about that. <laughs> well, I think the biggest thing. I'm a, this is giving my life story. My life story is based on adversity. You know, I'm a biracial kid, born and raised in Indiana in the mid '60s, and it was the best place to be in the mid '60s, biracial. You know, so <laughs> you learn. Um, you know, and it's, you know, you, I grew up in a, a household with blue collar workers. My dad worked two jobs. My jack, dad worked for an old international harvester trucking company back in the day. Um, and then he cleaned um, movie theaters at night. And then we went with him to clean the movie theaters. So we've been working, I've been working since I've been, you know, seven, eight years old. Uh, so it's, it's just a part of life. So you, you know, I'm going to talk about that. But uh, hopefully, the, you know, the guys get start believing who they are. I think that's the biggest thing. My biggest message tonight is for the kids who are playing is that they got to believe in who they see in the mirror. You know, a lot of kids, you think they believe it because they talk a good game uh, and they are sometimes very vocal about it. But a lot of times when it really comes down to it, they really don't believe in what they see. And a lot of the help that they can get comes from that same person they see in the mirror. And a lot of times we're always looking for external help. And a lot of times the person in the mirror can do the best job to help them. And uh, hopefully the kids get that message tonight. At what point did you start to believe in your own dreams? Well, I was, you know, I never had a dream about playing in the NFL. I played football because my brothers played football. I was the youngest of three boys. They played, I wanted to play. So I started playing, um, you know, and my youth coach, Dave Rohde, he was the guy that kind of like, put me on the path of really loving football. He made it fun, um, he made it enjoyable. And I just remember him telling me when I was really little, and I was really fast, he was like, talent's not everything. You know, learn the game. And, and I didn't know what he was saying when I was nine, 10 years old, but at, over the course of time, uh, he helped me understand what he, what, he was, what he was talking about. So I just think, I mean, he was there, um, my, my track coach in high school was there, um, Ray Sherman, who recruited me at Purdue to go to Purdue, he was the main reason I went to Purdue. Um, he was a great coach for me, and then when I got to the league, I mean, I was really blessed for 10 years in Pittsburgh. I, mean, I had Chuck Noll, Tony Dungy, and Joe Green was the defensive line coach, and Stallworth, uh, Mike Webster was still there, Donnie Shell was still there. So I got to talk to all those guys. Mel Mel Blunt, the first day I got into the locker room, that dude is a huge human being. Um, and then um, they left, a guy named Rod Russ came in, and then Rod Russ left, along with John Fox, he came in, and then um, Bill Collard, Dick DeBow, and Don Papers came in. So for 10 years, I was blessed with a lot of good guys there to uh, teach me a lot about football, a lot about life, and they helped me realize how good I could be in the sport. You played for several teams that have very distinct identities, especially the units that you were on. Compare and contrast to just some of your experiences, both with Pittsburgh, Baltimore, Oakland. Well, I mean, the first one, you know, Pittsburgh was, we kind of morphed into, that dynasty was kind of gone. When I got there, I think at first year we were, I think we were 8-8. Eight eight. Second year we were like 6-10. and 10. And then, but our draft class, we had, it was me, Greg Lloyd, Merrill Hodge, Delton Hall, Thomas Everett. Um, I can't, who else was in there? That was the 87 class. And then we had, my rookie year, we had two other guys from the holdover. So from the stripe, the scab year, we had two of those guys hold over. And they were basically rookies. So we had five rookies out of our nine guys in the secondary. So we were all young. Um, so we're all learning from each other, but Tony Dungeon was the best teacher because he was patient, <laughs> he was kind, because <laughs> we did a lot of stupid things on the field with Tony. Um, you know, I, I think that was a little different than all the other places because the other places I went to, 
they were a little more mature. We didn't grow into it. Like when I went to San Francisco for the first, that one year, I was trying to get a ring. We lost in a championship game to uh, the Green Bay Packers. Um, and then I went to Baltimore. When I went to Baltimore, they didn't have a great secondary. And I was the older guy in the room. And as they got Dwayne Starks the first year, and then going into the third year, they got Chris McAllister, and I moved to safety. And Kim Heron and Corey Harris, they were, the, they were back in the backfield with me too in the secondary. It was a little different. I mean, so my bond more, more so than anything is with my guys in, in Pittsburgh because we came in together and we grew up together for a long time. And Colonel Lake was in that same class, or not that same class, he came in the next year. And we played nine years together. So we, we built a strong bond. Those are my guys. Uh, where when I moved, it's a little bit different bond, but the way we played, like if you take away the Pittsburgh Steelers colors and the Baltimore Raven colors, very similar to the way they play. It's tough physical defenses. You're going to feel the hurt the next day. Uh, the fans are really, and Bouchotti took it over. But Bouchotti is a really good owner. Uh, and then you had the Rooney's who's been with the Steelers forever. So, um, from the top down, it trickles down to the onto the field, and those guys, both teams play very similar to each other. Who did you want to emulate uh, as a football player growing up? We had three channels. I didn't watch a lot of football. And one of them was a WGM. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, it's like, you know, the Pacers, or excuse me, not the Pacers, but the, uh, the Colts were there in Baltimore when I was young, so we watched Cincinnati, we watched, you know, Cleveland, because I was the closest to where Fort Wayne, Indiana was at, um, Little Detroit, um, but I played for the Pal Raiders when I was a little kid, okay. and that was like my team, so back in the day I had Lester Hayes when he had the Jerry Curl with the long tie, and he had his hands out like this, and he had the stick of them all on his hands, oh, yes. I had that poster in my bedroom, well, my brother's bedrooms. We always, we shared a bedroom, all three of us. But that poster was in our bedroom. Um, I didn't try to emulate anybody on the field. I just tried to work hard like my dad did. And my dad was a blue collar guy, he worked hard. He didn't complain, he didn't cry about it. Uh, when my back was hurting, I wasn't gonna cry about it and tell my coach I couldn't practice. I was gonna just grit my teeth and fight my way through it. So I think for the most part, I try to emulate my dad just the way he worked. Was it a hard decision for you to gravitate away from track? It was, it was. Um, I started running track when I was about 13 years old. And because um, we swam competitive first. And then um, the one thing about football and the one thing about team sports is a perception sport. You know, coaches tell you, well, I think he's good, I'm going to play him. Well, he looks better than this guy, I'm going to play him. Well, he looks better than this guy, I'm going to play him. Track, can't say that. Well, you're slow, and you run a 99, and you go, oh, maybe he's not slow. Well, I mean, it's you and the clock, and that's what I love about track. And coaches couldn't say anything to you, they couldn't tell you how good you were, how bad you were. You decided how good and bad you were, and that's what I love about it. It was an individual, it was a team sport, yes. But it was an individual sport because that's why they had individual lanes. And it was, it was tough. Um, yeah, I wish they, when I came in in 87, I wish they had the uh, rule like they did in 92, when they had the dream team and all that, and you had your professional status in the same sport. And, and my sport was different. I was trying to run track. I was trying to make the Olympics in 88. And ILC was like, no, you couldn't because you had a competitive advantage because you're a professional in football to run track, and we're like, you have no idea what football is, there, because that doesn't help you with running hurdles. So um, that was tough for me, but I still watch it. I, 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 normally, uh, NBC Sports, they normally show all the track and field things, so I, I normally watch that quite a bit. With different rules and uh, proper training, do you think you could have been an Olympian? Yeah. I mean, I had the fourth fastest time in the world that year. And that was my first time running outdoors in four years. And um, I never, now it's, and only, it was only like a two month window. Like, a, that's probably how much I ran outdoors. So I think about I ran the following year and the following year and the following year, I would have hoped I would have got faster. I, mean, I don't know, but I, I would have hoped I would have got faster. 
out of all of your career accolades, what would you, if you could pick one, what's the one you're most proud of that intercepts a return for a touchdown record? That's that's pretty pretty awesome. Um, getting into the hall. I mean, that's what else can you want? I mean, my my busk is bronzed in the into the dorms of the in Canton, Ohio. Can't leave it. Can't get away. And so if, if, if it's right, wrong, or indifferent, I'm there. And I mean, it's, you know, I, I started playing football not thinking about being a Hall of Famer. I mean, I was, when I went in in 2009, I was a 253rd individual, not player, individual, who, go, who went into the Hall. I mean, that's 253 people in the history of pro football to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. That's, to me, I still, still so surreal. It's been quite a while. I've been in there for <laughs> quite a while, but you know, um, even my kids. You know, we've, we've gone there a couple of times, and I'll go back this year because Ray is going in. That's my guy. Um, but to go back and see your busk in that room, and um, with all the other greats, it's it's pretty amazing. That's the next question I was going to ask. How awesome is it to have Ray in this year? And I mean, how was your teammate? Won the Super Bowl together. That's my guy. That's my guy. Um, you know, we did a lot of growing up. When I first got there, he was in his third year. Uh, I was in my 12th year. So we, we grew quite a bit together. Um, but he's a good man, great football player. Um, became, he wasn't, when I first got there, he wasn't the best leader. But by the third year, he became one of the best leaders I've seen in quite a while because he understood when he should say something to the players, when he shouldn't say something, when to correct a guy, when to praise a guy. Um, I mean, he did it with love and compassion and, and with passion. So, um, you know, he, he did his, his little squirrel dance every before every game and all that stuff. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, if he does the squirrel dance when he comes out at the hall. <laughs> Do you think he's the hardest hitting player you've ever played with? No, I can't say that one because Greg Lloyd. Kevin Green. Kevin Green. <laughs> I mean, Greg Lloyd, Kevin Green, Hardy Nickerson. We called him hardware for a reason. You know, I mean, I mean Hardy Nickerson. Um, I played with you know, Chad Brown, LeVon Kirkland, was a tough downhills north and south linebacker. David Little, when I first came in the league, David Little, uh, he would be. Went to a couple Pro Bowls with the Steelers. He was an old school downhills Mike backer. Um, it's kind of hard to say if he was the, the hardest hitting backer. I think he was the best overall backer. He can read and react. He was a great studier of the game, great student of the game. I think as he got older, he got even better because he believed in his anticipation and what he what he read on the in the film study and what he saw on the field. He just took off and he believed it, and uh, that made him really good at the end of his career too. What are some of the qualities that make a football player into a great football player? Oh, commitment, respect, responsibility, hard work, dedication, integrity, um, grit. Yeah, at the end of the day, you know, no matter how athletic you might be, it's still a physical game. It's still a contact sport. You're still going to have to bite your mouthpiece four or five times in a game and, and make a hit. Uh, that all goes into becoming a great player. Um, but I think really, at the end of the day, it's what Chuck Noll told me my second week in the league, is that talent is not everything. You have to learn the game mentally. And I, when he first said it, you don't really get it when you're young. But as he left and the other guys came in, I started realizing that you know, everybody, even these kids here at Montana State, they're all athletic. They're all here for a reason, you know. Some of these freshman kids, these coaches never touch them, but they still come here and get scholarships for a reason because they're athletic in some capacity. Some are faster, some are stronger, some are quicker. But it's the guy who can take his film study personal, his, what he gets from his coaches, what he gets from his peers, apply that back in practice every day, and back in games and have that recall in games, those guys separate themselves from the average kid to the great players in all sports. Last 10 years or so, football has been surrounded by a lot of controversy just in terms of head injuries and the way guys feel after they've been retired for a long time. What do you think of just the state of the game right now? I love the game. 
everything I have in my life, I have because of football. Um, so I can't, and, and I'm letting my boy play football. So, <laughs> you know, I, I believe in the game. And, um, you know, the, the lawsuit was predicated not because of the head injuries, it's because of the information that was not given. That's the reason. So I think, you know, we got to make sure that's correct. And then secondly, um, it's been good. The information that's given, the lawsuit's been good because now guys are more in tune to say, hey, I have a blurred vision, I have a headache, I feel nauseous. And they're, they're okay to say that because back in the day, that was like taboo to say. You, you know, you weren't tough if you said you had a headache after you made a big hit. You, know, you weren't tough if you said you felt nauseous. You weren't tough if you said you had blurred vision. Now we're saying, no, don't be tough, be smart. And kids are saying they, they have those symptoms and then they, they go into concussion protocol. So I think it's, it's way ahead. You know, now the new rule that they have where they're gonna start injecting people, that's very interesting. It's gonna be interesting to see how they really implement that rule and um, how they, I don't even know how you understand if somebody has intent or not. I don't, I don't intent's inside of you. So, so if somebody's not, if somebody's psychic in the building, Maybe they'll get it right, but it's going to be interesting to see how they do that one. So I'm a fan of the sport. I'm a fan of where they're going with it. I just want to see how they implement it, and then I can make more comments on that one. But I, I love the state of the game. It's kind of a, kind of a difference between uh, personal, regular personal foul basketball and play foul. <laughs> well, it is, but now they're saying even running backs, mm -hmm. they duck their head. I just don't know how they get low. You can't duck your shoulder without ducking your head. Your shoulder's not, your head's gonna go down naturally. And if it goes down and it makes contact with the crowd, I just say, just use your spearing rule. You already have it. Just use that. I think that'll help everybody, that'll help the refs, that'll help the fans. Just make the game easier that way. And don't hear a whole lot. And don't hear, that's right. You could pick, uh, was there one secondary player that you modeled your game after and you talked about Mel Blunt? No, because when I, you know, I was a safety. So, I, you know, I, I like hard hitting safeties and stuff like that. And Ronnie Lott was that guy when I first came in the league. But they moved me to corner. So I didn't like adapt how to play corner. And there's a lot of good corners when I, was, when I came in the league. So when I went to my first Pro Bowl, after my third year as a kick returner, I went to um, Hanford Dixon, Frank Minifield, Albert Lewis, um, those guys were at the Pro Bowl. I just asked them questions. I started picking their brain about what they see and how they play and how they cover guys and what's the little tricks of the trade that you can kind of get away with and the refs don't see you. And they start telling me, and I'm like, oh, yeah, this is a lot easier. And then, and at the same time, that's when I really started working out in the off season. I mean, my first three years, I was just kind of like, I went golfing, hit the ball, jogged to my ball, hit the ball, jogged to the next one, hit the next one, jogged. And I did my little 18 holes, and that was my workout. And then after my third year, I started, really started working out. I started getting up at 6.30 in the morning, started swimming, getting back on, I got back into the pool, got to the track, and, and really the main reason was because uh, Colonel Lake, he was a workout fanatic. So <laughs> I had to start going out with Colonel. And we just start working our butts off. Made it easy. Way too early, but I gotta ask, any teams that you think are gonna be uh, in the Super Bowl next season? Well, I like, when you look at the NFC, you, you have to love Philly again. You're getting your quarterback back. That dude is, Carson Wentz is pretty special. Mm -hmm. He's, he can throw that rock. Um, but then you add a Michael Bennett, and a loading nada to the defensive front already. I mean, it's not fair. Um, and then you look at LA, uh, LA getting the Dominic Sue, who's a talented, uh, rare specimen, and he's go he's gonna be playing with the best interior tackle in Aaron Donald in the league. I mean, that Aaron Donald's unblockable when, when, he's, when he's going. Um, and then they brought in Tlaib and Marcus Peters, so Wade Phillips is gonna play man-to-man, -man. Tight coverage and go get that quarterback, which that's a good formula to win a lot of football games. And if they, as offense, they play the same way, 
Yeah. That might be the championship game right there. That would be a fun championship game to watch, uh, the Rams and Philly. Um, I think when you look at the AFC, you know, Tom Brady's playing, you got to like New England. I mean, the dude is, the dude is good, you know. And so he's, he's always going to make them competitive. Um, yeah, if you look at Pittsburgh, it's, it's about their defense. Their defense has to step up to the plate. They got a good offense. They didn't lose to Jacksonville because of their offense. They lost to the defense. They, they, they haven't had a playmaker for quite a while on the defensive side, and so they need to find that in the draft. Um, if they do that, I think they have an opportunity also. And they've seen Jacksonville is a young, good team. Um, you know, got to see how Burrow does. If he's if he can add to what he, he can't be the same guy he was this past year. He has to add to that. If he gets better, that makes them better. But if he stays status quo, then they'll they'll be competitive because their defense is really good. But they won't get to the Super Bowl.